Good evening and welcome to the Adventurers Club of Los Angeles. I'm your host for the evening, Rich Mayfield, member 1211. I'm your first VP for uh, this year and your program's chairman. So I'm here interviewing people because our club has shut its doors out of abundance of caution with the COVID pandemic. Um, so we're doing these interviews. We're pleased to bring you stories of adventure still. We're keeping it going. We're having a lot of fun here. So if you like our YouTube channel, don't forget to subscribe, like our videos, share them with all your friends, right? Get the word out there because if the Adventurers Club is anything, it's about sharing stories of adventure. That's what we all have in common. That's why we come here, right? So tonight I have with me Matt Allison. Thank you for being here, Matt. So Matt is a member of the Travelers Club, correct? The Century the Travelers Tra Century Travelers Club. Century Club. So you are definitely a well-traveled person. Yep, I've, yeah. I've traveled to 170 or so sovereign UN recognized countries and 200 plus territories and countries if you put all those together. So I have to ask you, because we had, we had Bill Altifer here as a yeah. member. Bill is, claims to be the most traveled person and since he's our member, we count him as the world's most traveled person. But I know that there's always a question of how you count and who is the world's most traveled person. So I don't want to know if you are the most traveled person, but he, are you at least in the top 10? Bill's far more traveled than I am. Um, I, top 10, I, there's a lot of people out there yeah. with far more time and money than me to, to travel. So, But you're no slouch. I, <laughs> no, I, I'm up there, maybe for my age, yeah. but I, top, I don't know, not top 10, but top 200 maybe but you are on the yeah. site where everybody tracks it and everybody competes the yeah, mtp yeah, travel I, I started filling out that that form but it just it's just too much time to yeah, yeah my attention span isn't that There's so many boxes to check <laughs> right exactly <laughs> i so mean i'm I, not I that up. well traveled it was fun for me because i'm like oh i found one you know it was like a but i mean imagine for guys like you it's like ah click 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 I, click click i love traveling i don't want it to be like a competitive thing though so I try to avoid that. You know, sometimes you do get caught up in that, in that spirit. I can't help it. But I, I try to avoid that whenever possible. Yeah. Yeah. It is fun, though. I mean, everybody <laughs> a little bit, competes yeah. a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Well, I'm, pr I'm proud of it. I'm proud of my absolutely. travels. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're here tonight to talk about one of your more off-the-beaten-path adventures, where you went um, to Siberia, and you found a very remote tribe and you hung out with them and, and, and watched them uh, herd some reindeer and go about their yeah, lives. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about how this trip got on your radar. Because I always say, like, at the Adventurers Club, one thing you never have to do is explain why you did it, right? Everybody, everybody here knows that they're, I mean, we've had people try to answer why, and he's just like, stop, there's no why. You did it right. because it's there, right? So I don't want to hear about the why. I want to hear about how it got on your radar, right? Sure. Because you can only travel certain places. So what made this one a place that you're like, yep, that's the next place right. I'm going to go? So all my travels have been about trying to find the most remote places on the planet. And that includes the most remote tribes, populations of people that still live traditional existences. So, and, and up until... Going to the Yamal Peninsula to visit the Nenets, I lived with other tribes, and I would ventured very exotic people from around, cultures from around the world. And I, I came across, in, in preparing for like my trip to Papua New Guinea, I went to Papua, and I, I was trekking in the highlands, visiting some of the different tribes there, the penis Gorded tribes, the um, Yali, for example. I one of my virtual or internet friends that helped me plan that trip who had also been to the same area, he had a website and he had done some incredible, phenomenal travels around the world. And I, had, I, I saw that one of the places he had visited was the Yamal Peninsula. He, he knows Russian, He's, he is a British guy who learned Russian by living in Moscow. He had been up to the Yamal Peninsula, just went up there by himself, met the nomads, befriended some different families up there, and had incredible pictures. And so just browsing his website, his photos, I, I saw these pictures and I'm like, where is that? I didn't know that such a place existed, you know, where people still lived in, they're like teepee-like structures and they wear reindeer furs. And it looked like something out of photos of Native Americans from the 1800s, you know, like something that I didn't think existed in the modern era. Huh. And he's like, yeah, this place is alive and well. 
If you ever want to go up there, let me know, and I can help you go there, or I can go with you. Nice. And I figured the you know, there's no other better time to go than in the winter time. I wanted to go Oof. during the most challenging time to see them in, in the place where they live, adapted, you know, in the most extreme conditions where they live. And at the time, sitting in San Diego, you know, in 70 degree weather, it seemed like a great idea. Right. But then when I was there in the Amal in February, it, it was, it, then it was a very, it seemed like a very terrible idea when it was 50 below zero outside. Yeah. It's something, <laughs> well, I mean, San Diego is probably like the most temperate, perfect weather every day of the year. There's never a bad right. day in San Diego. So you're like, oh, weather, it's just weather, no problem. <laughs> but that is a great way to like find an adventure. You saw a picture, yep. it fascinated you, and you're like, I'm going to go there. So you contacted this guy, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and he offered to, to show you how to do it because it's a hard place to get to, right? So how did you get there? Where'd you fly into? The In order to get there, so I've been communicating with him for years, sharing travel ideas and everything, and then, and then kind of flirting with the idea of going to the Yamal. And then finally the, the time came where I'm like, I, I gotta go, you know, cultures change. If I don't go now, I may miss the window to see them in their most traditional. And so I'm like, you know, I'm just gonna go. And so I, I at first, I was just gonna, I was gonna go with one of my friends who I knew would be very interested in the trip. And we planned to go in the winter time. And I, he was giving me some of the logistical information. He's like, fly into Moscow, you need to get a permit to go to the Yamal Peninsula. And just so you know, the Yamal Peninsula is located above the Arctic Circle, mm -hmm. up in the middle northern section of Siberia in Russia. It, it's about a two and a half day train journey to get there to Salak Yard. Just to like and the main main town in the Just to get to the main town, yeah. What does Yamal mean? Vorkuta, I mean. What does Yamal mean? Is Yamal means, the, it's a Nenet word that means the end of the world. Oh. And so I decided that, <laughs> you know, right place to go. I was gonna go, I needed to go there. I couldn't go on my own, I would end up dead. So I ended up asking my, my friend who speaks Russian, who lived in Moscow to join us. And so he did, he joined us, and not as a really, he was kind of a guide, but more as a fellow traveler. Mm -hmm. And we paid his way to go with, and then we traveled from Moscow in a train with, it's not a tourist train, this was full of Russian miners. It's a working and, train. Yeah, second class. It was rough. Everybody had their shoes, not just their shoes off, but their socks off, like, and, and they're all jammed in, bunk beds, <laughs> lots of people drinking vodka, eating meat, two so like and a half eating, days, like, 80 eating, degrees inside. But like, vodka, that's a real thing that people like really hit hard in Siberia. Like the stereotypes are accurate. Very, very accurate. Anybody who's been to Siberia will tell you that it, it, it's an accurate stereotype, yeah. They drink vodka and they eat meat. I, I drank vodka from the moment I started that train journey, and then until the moment I returned back to Moscow. Every day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, there was always vodka involved. Hmm. It was, was it good? sickening. Was it good or was it like, you know, the, uh, the jungle juice whiskey that we have? I, I don't know. <laughs> I can't say I enjoyed it, but when it's that cold, and the Nenets explained to me later on, they're like, hey, it's so cold out here that we just drink the vodka to make us feel better, to feel warmer. That's the main reason why we drink it. And I learned that they're right. You do feel warmer. But you're not the actually warmer, is... right? Like, it's not medically helping you. No, you just feel warmer. You, you just feel better <laughs> about the whole situation. Yeah, <laughs> right. It doesn't actually physically make you feel warmer. Right. It, it's, it, doing, it, it's not doing good things. Like, it's not medicine. It's, right. It's, it's definitely hurting you, but it, just the whole situation's better. They drink it from the moment, the, the Nenets, they drink it in the morning before they set off into the tundra to round up reindeer and to take the reindeer into uh, grazing grounds. They, they'll drink it throughout the day. They don't drink, um, they don't drink to the point to where they, they become too intoxicated to, to do their work and to properly graze their reindeer, but they definitely drink a lot. A lot They've more got than a buzz I would, on. Right. 
More than I would feel comfortable with. So like, like, like smokers would smoke cigarettes. They're basically yeah. like maintaining. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're functioning alcoholics, I guess. So back to the train. You're on a train, right? Two with, and a half days. With all these miners yep. that sh shoes off, socks off, bunk yeah. beds, hanging out, lots drink, of, drinking lots of, vodka. Lots of meat, lots of vodka. Everybody's playing cards. It was just, it was a fun time. The train was hot. I don't know if you've ever been on a, on a Russian train, but they, so they use coal to heat up the carriages and it's very hard to regulate the heat and you can't open the windows. So it just gets really hot inside to the point to where a lot of people just take their shirts off, their socks off, and it's very crowded. So huh. there's, a, there's a, a stench of BO in there. It's, yeah. it's not pleasant. Yeah. And you're on bunk beds, you're, there's shared, there's only like two bathrooms that everybody shares. Everybody's eating it's, pure it's protein. It's pretty rough, two and a half days. They do stop every hour, hour and a half or they so. They air out the car? <laughs> or they keep the doors they'll, shut? They'll step, they, you can go outside. Like I would constantly leave the carriage and stand outside in the freezing cold just to get some air. Yeah. And The uh, Russians are looking at you like you're crazy. No. They, would they do it too? They, 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 whenever the train stopped, they, they would walk wearing just shorts, flip-flops. Wow. They would walk around. They would walk around in the cold. Wow. And yeah, it's, it's, they're used to it. <laughs> I mean, up until we got up into the Nenets area, you know, we're talking like from Moscow. When we left Moscow, it was probably like 10 below. And as we got further and further north, it got colder and colder. And then when we got up into the Yamal at 50 below zero, now we're just in extreme cold territory. Yeah. Where Were they walking like, around in their shorts and flip-flops no, and that no. 50, negative not, 50? Not, not like in that. And that's yeah. 50 below. That is, so when I checked the forecast, it was 50 below every day. That doesn't include the wind chill. That's right. just the straight temperature. Wow. So that, I grew up in Minnesota. Yeah, in it's Minnesota, cold there, right? I, I know cold. Yeah. I'm comfortable with cold. I don't really like it, but I'm comfortable with it. But I never experienced any kind of cold similar to what I experienced in the Yamal Peninsula. In Minnesota, maybe at the coldest it gets 20 below, and you're always within earshot of a, a warm house, some place you can escape to to get away from the cold. But when you're out in the open tundra and the Yamal, it can be hundreds of miles, especially when you're with the Nenets, staying with them in their tombs, their teepees, you're hundreds of miles from the nearest village. So you're completely at their mercy. Wow. Yeah, it's and 50 below zero with wind chills adding to maybe another 10, 20 degrees of negativity. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, so, okay, so, so the train didn't take you to this, this Nenet camp, th camp, right? Thank you. So like, the train, two and a half days, takes you to Vorkuta. You cross the Ural Mountains, which separates Europe Russia from Asia, Russia. Okay. And when you get to um, Vorkuta, that, so that, and I want to mention too that the train tracks in the further latitudes were built by gulag prisoners, many of them which were buried beneath the train tracks that they oh. helped build. And now once you get into the last few hundred miles of train tracks, you are now in roadless territory. There are no more roads. The only way to get into this, this region is by train or by airplane. Hmm. So we got to Vorkuta, and then from there, there's one, there is one road that connects. It's not connected to Moscow, but it connected a Vorkuta to the Salak Yard, which is another town I, was, I needed to go to. So we, we took a taxi to Salak Yard. It was like four, four, five, and I'm pronouncing these names incorrectly. But it, four or five hours, I think, and then from there, we spent the night with uh, some college-age kids that were friends with my buddy, and they, and they were very proud of their giant poster, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And their, oh, yeah? And their, yeah. That was kind of funny. Yeah, they had, Arnold Schwarzenegger killed a lot of Russians, though. I, I, they, in Russia, they love <laughs> Arnold? The big, strong, you know. That's who is always fighting, though. Right? It, it didn't matter. They, they <laughs> loved him because he's strong. He's got, you know, they like Putin. Putin's a yeah. strong kind of dictator yeah. type. Schwarzenegger emanated strength. That's what they respect over there. So mm -hmm. 
Most people, most people anyways. Sure, so, I mean, everywhere, right? It's not just Russia. Yeah. That is the stereotype though, right? Yeah. But I mean, here in America, it, it's the same thing. We this, love that guy. This part we of made Russia. made him the governor. <laughs> this part of Russia is, the people that live in this part of Russia are tough, tough people. To live in this kind of an extreme environment, they are a different breed of people. I have a lot of respect for them. I'd and say. it's not just the Nenets, it's the Russians too that live up there that work in the, the natural gas mines. The Yamal Peninsula is a big natural gas mining area. It's one of the largest reserves in the world. It's really hard to get to. You have to get permissions in advance. It could take months. You may even get declined. Um, up until like 10 years ago, it was impossible for foreigners, especially Americans, to go here. And is this because they have uh, national security uh, concerns? It's strategic because uh -huh. of the, the natural gas reserves. And, it's, and Russia is kind of squeamish about people visiting, or has been in the past, or opening up a little bit, but they've been squeamish in the past about people visiting some of the more remote areas of the country. Mm -hmm. This is definitely remote. We got the permissions to go. My friend arranged all of that. And so from, from this town where we stayed with some of his college age buddies, we, uh, we took a trekkle, which, which is this giant tundra monster truck. Because at this point there are no roads and you have to travel over the tundra. You can't build a road in the tundra because of the uh, fluctuating, um, as it melts and refreezes every year, the levels fluctuate up and down so you can't build a permanent road hmm. so it's easier to travel in the winter time on ice roads the treckles they travel together like in on a, rivers right rivers okay. and sometimes just over the tundra but they they try to follow a river or different lakes there's a lot of lakes up there and that's a smoother and, ride is that yep, smoother when you're ride. going over the tundra is it is it like pillowy like is it up and down and you know yeah. It's hard to say because in a treckle, it was a rough ride. <laughs> it, was, it was not built for comfort, it was built for function. It's a Soviet contraption and they cranked the heat up inside. And I remember the driver was from like Uzbekistan, <laughs> a much warmer place. And I'm like, what the heck are you doing up here? And he's like, job, lots of jobs up here in the Northern Arctic. Nobody wants to work up here. <laughs> so you get paid pretty well. But they travel, we travel in a convoy. So there was about three trekkles. Real quick, do we have a picture of a trekkle? I'm trying to envision this. Um, I think I've seen them before. I, but Andy, can you find us a picture of a trekkle to throw in here? I have, I have one on my, my website, a travel website. Oh, is that the trekkle? That is, yeah, that, that is a trekkle right there that looks similar. That's an older looking one, I think. That is similar to a trekkle. So it's a tracked vehicle. Correct, yep. So you, this way it's able to travel over the ice and the tundra. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an all-terrain vehicle. And the back of this one looks like it's just a tarp. So you weren't, like, they, was yours all enclosed? It's enclosed, they crank the heat up, and they travel in a convoy because these things break down frequently. Yeah. And if somebody breaks down, you will die out there. It was, when we traveled, it was a blizzard and it was easily 50 below zero, if not colder. And one of the other trekkles did break down. And so everybody got out, they were standing outside freezing because their heat failed. Actually what happened was it, the trekkle didn't break down, their heat broke down. Hmm. And so essentially the trekkle is no longer functioning. They can't, you can't travel without heat. So everybody got out and they jumped in our trekkle and they piled in. It wasn't comfortable at all. It was just a way from getting from point A to point B. And it took about seven hours, I think, to get to this tiny little town called Yarsdale, which is a, a natural gas mining town where some of the Nenets do live. Mm -hmm. Nenets are about 40,000 people. Half of them are nomadic. The other half have settled down in the villages. Every Nenet family that's nomadic has a family has relatives that live inside the village. So mm -hmm. it's normal for them to go back and forth from living out in the tundra in their nomadic lifestyle to the village sometimes to stay with their families. They've kind of got a base, like they've got they have an a anchor. base, they go back and they sell things. They, 
uh, relax, drink vodka, you know, share reindeer meat with their relatives, yeah. and and then they go back off into the into the tundra where they could spend months and months at a time. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you get the, the trekkle takes you to this village. Yep. And 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 you meet some nenets up there. But that's not yeah. your ultimate destination, right? No, nope, that wasn't. So we stayed, at this point we got to a village and we stayed with a, um, some nenets that were living in a house. It was the nenet family and the, the, my Russian British friend, I don't know what to call him, we'll call him Edward. He, he that's his name. He, he <laughs> I had, call he him had, Ed, his name. <laughs> he, he had befriended these nenets and so we stayed with this these relatives, we were waiting. So he had prearranged in the past for the nomads to come within a certain time frame, not on a specific date, because they kind of, you can't, when they passed through the previous time they were in the area, their relatives said, hey, uh, Ed would like to come back with some other foreigners and would like to travel with you into your encampment. So you don't pick a specific date, you pick a kind of a general time range when they were gonna show up. And so we were waiting. We waited about two or three days for them. We didn't know exactly what day they were gonna show up. Mm -hmm. And then when they did, they finally did show up with their snowmobile, we um, were expecting to leave early in the morning to go out to their tombs, their encampments where they live in these teepee-like structures where they have their reindeer and they, where they move around. They move around in these encampments. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea how far away the tomb was gonna be. I was told it was close by, I didn't know what that meant. But I knew that we had to leave early in the morning because it just seemed like a safe idea versus That's going. normally when you want to leave is early anytime, in the morning. Anytime you want to go on a big expedition, especially in a place where it's 50 below zero, you want to leave in the morning where you have a lot of daylight. And this is a place where in February, you have like five or six hours of daylight. We're yeah. at this point, we're above the Arctic Circle. And it was only like, Three, three weeks, I think, before my arrival, or three or four weeks, where there was no daylight in this place because they're above the Arctic Circle. So what we, does, you know, I've always wondered, maybe you can answer this for me, what does the Arctic Circle mean? Like, I know it's a line circumscribed in the globe. I understand what the equator is. I understand what the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn are. It's a, la it's a latitude and a line that, I don't know the exact... Significance or? I mean, I don't know the exact uh, degree. I, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what the degree it's gotta is. Gotta mean something, right? It's like 15 degrees or something like that. It's just the exact latitudinal line, geographical latitudinal line that goes all the way around the globe up in the yeah. northern, northern latitudes. By the way, the thing that's great about this program, I didn't mention this to you, we are live, right? And we do have right. members watching and I'm, Dollars to donuts, I bet some member's about to answer this question in the chat. Uh, of course. No, uh, <laughs> yeah. no, I know, I know. This yeah. club has that knowledge somewhere, knows, knows what that I, actually, I know, actually and means. I know, so. and, and I should know that too, and I feel bad for not knowing Because what we know is yeah. we know it's, it's cold as shit up there. Like when you get into the Arctic right. Circle, it starts to get serious. But I'm just wondering, okay, so I gather from the way you're starting to tell this story that you guys did not leave in the morning. We didn't correct? leave in the morning. So when the nomadic family showed up, it was, uh, it was a dad, a son, and his wife and daughter. So they showed up with, with a snowmobile and a sledge. And the sledge is just like a, a wooden kind of carriage that is pulled by the snowmobile. They showed up, I don't know where they came from. They, they just showed up and they were excited to see their relatives. So they. They caught up, you know, like all relatives, like people do, and they don't get to see each other for a while. They, they were drinking, they drank a lot of vodka, a lot of vodka, and they, we ate a lot of uh, raw reindeer meat that day. You can do that? I don't know if it's, we did. I don't know if it's wow. advisable, huh. but it, it was frozen, and then we, well, it was thawed out and we ate it, right? But it, it tasted pretty good with vodka. It wasn't that, yeah. I mean, not, not too bad. Vodka makes everything better, right? <laughs> right. So. We did not leave. I honestly didn't expect to leave that day. I thought we were just going to leave, you know, the next morning. Right. Nope. Sunset. And this nomadic family was like, okay, we're ready to go. Let's head up. Get your stuff together. 
And I'm like, all right, what are we gonna wear? I mean, we had, I had uh, snow pants, I had, you know, some, some of my best winter REI gear from Minnesota. Right. And I thought, you know, this might be good in Minnesota, but I knew that maybe this might not be warm enough out here. I mean, so I asked them, like, all right, do, do you have reindeer fur? Because that's what they have. They have reindeer fur, Melitzas, I think they're called. It's like a full body reindeer fur outfit that they all wear with a hood. I'm like, okay, do you have that for us? And I'm like, oh, we have a, it's a two piece suit. They're like, we have an upper body one, but the lower body one is back in the tomb in the encampment. So when you get there, we'll give that to you. We have extra ones for you. And so I'm like, well, okay, so I have snow pants and I have some boots and extra, you know, thick thermal socks, wool socks and everything. I'm like, this is gonna be okay for out there? You know, I had my doubts and I'm like, oh, no problem. It's not that far away. And we get in the snowmobile. Me and my friend are in the sledge. And there was a, so the, the wife and the daughter actually left earlier in another snowmobile. Uh -huh. And they took off and went off to the encampment. I don't, we should have just went with them. I don't know why we didn't, but there's not a lot of communication. I'm not really clear about what's going on. This is kind of the theme for the entire trip. And like I said, my, my friend who was taking us out there, he wasn't really a guide, he was like a co-traveler. Right. And I don't think he really even, he wasn't worried about a thing. And he didn't really communicate a whole lot and everything. So we we're always left out in the, in, in the cold, so to speak. <laughs> you know, Literally. I, literally and figuratively. We didn't know what the hell was going on half the time. But, you know, it, it was an adventure. It was a great adventure. But I got to tell you, one of the scariest things that happened to me was traveling at nighttime in the back of this sledge. It was bone jarring for one. So we were being pulled. It was a fast ride, it was very bumpy. Uh, it, it was really rough on your back and it wasn't cushioned at all. No insulation whatsoever. So a sledge, you're, just you're not bumping, saying bumping. sled, you're saying sledge. A sledge, it's a wooden sledge. It's carved out of one, one piece actually. It's like one giant piece of wood. So this and sounds like a, the barge of the sledding world. Like if a sled is a night, is that thing that you see kids going down the hill at Christmas. This it, sounds like it's, it's a barge kind of, it's like almost. A, yeah, it's like a giant, like a Santa sledge, if you can imagine that. And they use it to, to carry things like reindeer antlers, meat, uh, their house, their, their chooms to carry things that they're, because they move around. It's common for them, especially in the summertime and even in the winter to break camp and to move to a new location to take their reindeer to graze. And they do it, they do it multiple times. When I was there with them, they didn't do it because at that time it was so cold, they only do it like once every few weeks. And I was there for a week. I stayed with them for a week. But, so we're traveling in this sledge and we had this uh, like a blanket over our head, but it didn't keep the cold out. You could feel the wind nipping at you and, and it's, it was a very, a very violent ride. And so you're just shaking violently. You can't see anything. You don't know where you're going, how far <laughs> you're gonna travel, how long. So you're just bundled and, up with the car cargo. You just jump in with all the cargo and so put the blanket on. You just- I've got the reindeer fur sure jacket with a hood on, but just my snow pants and thermal layers underneath. It didn't take long, maybe 30 minutes before I couldn't feel my feet anymore, uh -oh. right? And my, I knew my feet, I, I'm familiar with the cold and the effects of cold and all the different stages of frostbite, hypothermia, growing up in Minnesota. And I, I could feel the stages kicking in from my legs and my feet. I'm like, this, this is not a good thing. And, but there's no way for me to ask, I, I wanted to tell the driver and, and my friend, they're up in this snowmobile in the front, right? I wanted to Your tell Your buddy's him, on the snowmobile. Yeah, he's up in the front with a, with a nomad, the, the guy, the father of, the, of this encampment. Sounds like the better place and, to be riding. <laughs> right. So I couldn't talk to them and I wanted to tell them, you know what, guys, let's just turn back. Let's just forget it tonight. Let's leave in the morning. There's no way for me to talk to them. And then so now, after about an hour into the ride, I realize it might be too late for us to turn back now. All of a sudden, we flip over. We flip over and we go flying out of the sledge and we just tumble in the darkness, in the cold darkness of the night. And we, oh, what the hell just happened? And, 
And I get up, and then uh, they're laughing up in the front, the, the, the nomad, the dad, and then my friend. They're laughing, and they're, and they're taking swigs of a bottle of vodka as they're driving and as they're standing there. And the snowmobile flipped over. And then so the nomad guy, he, 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 gra- he gives me the bottle of vodka, and he's like, you take a swig. You'll feel better. And, I, and then I explain to my friend, and I have him translate to the nomad. I'm like, hey, I can't feel my feet. You know, I can't feel my legs. I think we should go back. And he's like, just drink, drink another swig of vodka. You'll be OK. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm serious. We should go back. And I'm trying to be, I'm not trying, you know, I don't want them to think I'm, I'm afraid because, you know, right. that's not what I want. That's not the, I, and I they're just yeah. laughing and drinking vodka. Yeah. Yeah. So. But there's a thing there, right? Because they have some serious physiological adaptations that they've developed. They're used to it. Plus, they have the full reindeer fur outfit. Right. They got the, the legs, the leggings, and the feet. And, and but you know, it's like it's not the, just the, man, the man in me is like, I don't want them to think I'm afraid. I was terrified. Right. <laughs> I won't But lie. it's not just about being tough. Like, there's acclimatization that you have to, yeah. that, that you're not. Right, right, you're from right. San Diego. They, I mean, they, you're from Minnesota, this, but I mean. They've adapted to this environment for a thousand years. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, I'm from San Diego. 20, and I'm sure 20 you're years Minnesota, or so. Min- Min- Minnesota, well, I mean, I, I grew know, up in Minnesota, like, but I've been 20 years Coast in San friends, Diego. They're like, you know, California makes you soft. I know Minnesota <laughs> people are like, you live in San Diego now, you're soft. You can't handle the cold. Right? There's an element to that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, yeah, it's, it's a little harder to, you do get, you get spoiled by the, by the nice weather in San Diego. Yeah, for sure. So thank God this thing flipped over and gave it, you a chance to walk around, It, it right? gave me a chance to walk around, and that's, that's key right there. So up until then, I was idle, right? No uh-huh. blood flowing. So the nomad guy, he tells me, he's like, he, he had a, got a very serious face, and he looks at me, he's like, it was translated through my friend. He's like, if you want to save your feet, we need to wrestle. And I'm like, whoa. And then he, he like gets down in this like wrestling stance and he just lunges for me. And at that point, <laughs> and I could barely stand up because my feet are like ice blocks. And then I'm like, oh, all right. So I, I, I return the, you know, I, I wrestle him, throw him to the ground. He throws me to the ground. And we, we tumble around wrestling for like 20 minutes. And He's kind of crazy, hooping and hollering, and, and he's he's having a great time. And and you know what? It didn't even. It finally occurred to me at the end. I didn't even think about it. He's right. My feet warmed up. My legs warmed up. The circulation kicked back up, and I warmed up. And so, we we actually stopped a few more times and wrestled. <laughs> and the Stoberville side. It's like yeah. Uh, that, so we that. stopped and. But at this this one situation right here, he had lost the key to the snowmobile, what? and he was looking for it in the <laughs> snow. And, but here's the thing, though: he was a joker too. He was a big joker, a prankster, and he knew that we were worked up by all this. And so yeah. I never knew like if it was BS or not. And but and I also knew that if they lose the key, they'll figure out a way to hotwire the thing. You know, it's like. Yeah. These For guys sure. are not afraid in this environment, and they'll always figure out a way. And as long as I'm with them, hopefully, maybe we stand a chance. <laughs> right. And he, when I when I said, "Hey, can we go back to the village?" You know, we were about an hour away at this point. He's like, "Now nah, we're almost there. We'll just keep going. We, we'll get to the camp. You know, in no time." Of course, that wasn't the case. It was another two, two and a half hours to, until we finally got so to the camp. So you had like a three and a half to four hour yeah. ride in this sledge, just getting beat, beat up. Yeah. And then every once in a while, they, they would stop and this, uh, <laughs> this prankster guy would they, come and start wrestling you. Yep. <laughs> and You didn't get any sleep in there, I imagine. There was no sleep. It was terrifying. It was a horrible experience. I contemplated what death would feel like. It, yeah? <laughs> yeah, it was like it was one of the more... you started hallucinating, right? Yeah, you, which you know, I, I some would, guy coming off of a snowmobile to tackle you and start wrestling you is pretty close to the hallucinations, you, right? You, that, you had to you had to find a happy place yeah. to relocate to, definitely. And yeah. La Jolla, <laughs> it was challenging. La Jolla, and, and my other and it, so I, my one friend who was our quasi guide was in the front of, on the snowmobile, and I was traveling with my other buddy, who was in the same predicament as me. We're both in this sledge, and he's terrified too. <laughs> I mean this. 
we, we still talk about this. This was about, just so you know, this is about, I don't know, six years ago when I did this trip. Me and this other guy that went on this adventure, every time I see him, he lives in Texas now, we always talk about this adventure like it happened yesterday. It had such a large impact on us. Like, So were you it, talking when you're under that tarp? or we were couldn't you talk. Just like, it was too shit, loud. Shit, shit, shit. It was too loud. It was too hard to talk. We just... You just bundled up, and we're, it. we're bundled up next to each other, too. <laughs> like, yeah. We're trying to preserve warmth by trying to be close to each other as yeah. much as possible. So there weren't any qualms about spooning. No, as, not, as hard not, as you could spoon, you were spooning. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was life or death at that point. So. Yeah. yeah. So you got to the camp all right. So we finally, I had written, I, I just decided that I'm going to die. At that point, I had written off life in general, and then all of a sudden, the snowmobile stops, figuring, okay, it's another wrestling match. Nope. <laughs> I look out in the distance, and I see this faint little light, and I'm like, that's it, that's the camp. And it's just one little light, two little lights, actually. There's two little teepee-like structures. So this is the one encampment. It's just two families, and they had stopped like 100 yards away. I don't know why they decided not to go all the way up to the tomb just yeah. to build up the suspense and make us run a little further or something or make it more of a challenge. So I, I decided I wasn't going to ask any questions. There was warmth over there. I'm going there. I don't care if this is the right place or not. That's where I'm going. <laughs> I see light. There must be warmth. Right. So I sprinted ahead and I just ran inside, lifted open the door, just like a flap of reindeer hide jumped inside and it was the the mother the nomad mother the daughter and the son another one of the younger sons I just sat down right in front of they had a little like a, a wooden fireplace yeah. and a, a, a wooden oven a, uh, oven for wood and I just jumped right in front of that thing and just I practically hugged it. <laughs> and I didn't say I didn't say hi or anything to them. I just at that point I was all about the fire. Where was your buddy up. that was in the sledge with you? He was he was not too far behind me. Yeah. <laughs> he was coming behind me. Yeah. And then um, it's weird because I, I ran inside the tomb and, and nobody even said anything to me. It was just <laughs> They know this song they, and dance? <laughs> no, they, so it's not like they, they don't get Visitors very it's not like I think there was one other like group of photographers that had visited yeah. them But it's not normal for them to get foreigners, but they it's recognize not, someone that's cold out of their mind Well, they knew they, they knew we were coming because they had left the mm -hmm. house of their relatives before us And so they knew we were coming behind them. So they knew we were coming right, but I mean I would expect to see like my husband first or something or my dad <laughs> right coming to that tent But it wasn't it was just like door flaps open and here's yeah, Matt house right. Making a mad dive for the stove, <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, okay. Okay. Here we go You guys are here cool and, and I think at that point too, I think the the mother saw the expression of terror on my face and knew uh -huh. and, and knew that okay, I needed to warm up and I think she did kind of look after me without it they, they don't mother people mm -hmm. in the same way that our culture does. But in her own way, I think she was. She saw that I was by the fire. She wasn't going to mess with me. Yeah. She was just going to let me warm up. Huh. And then so the, the rest of the group followed. They came inside, drank some more vodka. And we had a, I think we had a meal. We ate some uh, more reindeer meat and then maybe some fish, frozen fish that they warmed up and... I remember I fell asleep next to the fire and I didn't even put on my reindeer leggings at that point. Mm -hmm. I was so exhausted and just so happy to be by the fire. I fell asleep in my sleeping bag, which was rated to like negative 20 or something like that. Ne or ne not negative, um, maybe zero degrees, I think. Or but negative, you're in, negative the, 10. You're in and the tent at this point. In the tomb. tomb. So I fell asleep next to the fire. In the middle of the night, I wake up because I can't breathe or the air is so cold. I'm choking on it. It's pitch black. It's freezing cold, shivering. I look around. The fire's out. I'm like, where the hell's the fire? What the hell happened to the Why would you turn? Who would put out the fire out here? Like, what right. is wrong with these people? 
No, they have they have a spare. You know, they have a they don't have a lot of firewood, so uh -huh. they only use it for cooking. Huh. So nobody bothered to tell us that the fire goes out at nighttime. I fell asleep and I woke up very rudely to no fire and death and, cold. Yeah, yeah. And, and so at that point, I, I checked my watch and I realized, okay, it's like uh, two o'clock in the morning. They're not going to wake up until I don't know when they wake up, and I just have to rough this out until zero vodka thirty. <laughs> So I'm just sitting there shaking in my sleeping bag and just trying to stay warm. I mean, it was a rough night. Huh. I didn't know what was going on. And finally, I remember maybe an hour before sunrise, there was some stirring inside the tomb. The mother woke up. She put some firewood in the stove to make breakfast. And that was my happiest moment of the day. That was always, every day, the happiest moment of my day. Yeah. Because you can, and then at that point too, I, I, I finally got the actual leggings for the reindeer and I put those on and, and that with my upper body, it's just like a, it was like a straight jacket of reindeer fur. Right. It was very restrictive, but it was warm. It kept you warm. I didn't take that off again for the rest of the week. I left that on. It was not, that was not coming. Nobody could pry that off of me. And, and is that how much, pretty pretty much it works? Do they, do they take off their jackets and stuff when they come into they, tombs or? They, um, they, they do actually, they do. They take it off because when, well, they're out there actually working. You know, mm -hmm. they're out there rounding up reindeer, lassoing reindeer, separating them. They're doing work and they actually sweat because the reindeer, the militsas, they're, they're very warm. And if you're out there working and you're acclimatized to, to the cold and everything, you sweat and that sweat builds up on the inside and the fur, and it will freeze, and that, it'll kill you. It'll hmm. kill you, actually, if you don't take off. When the, when the uh, men come in, after being out all day, they'll take off their militsa, and they'll hang it up by the fire, and they'll dry it. Because hmm. if they don't, that sweat will freeze, and they'll, it'll kill them. Hmm. They'll get hypothermia. So they do take it off, but that only when the fire is going, because the fire is warm. But I found out that basically, yeah, they turn off the fire at nighttime. And so they, they, the fire is only there for breakfast, lunch, and dinner when they cook. And then at nighttime, they turn it off, and you just sit there in the cold. And the actual chum, the reindeer hide teepee structure, will insulate the occupants down to, if it's negative 50, 60 degrees outside, it'll get down to around negative 10 or so inside at nighttime. Jeez. Like at the early, you know, like I'm talking like hours after the fire goes out, it'll get down to negative 10, zero degrees, somewhere around there. That's so, still pretty stinking cold. Yeah, so you, they actually, they don't, I had my sleeping bag, but, and I would put like a blanket of reindeer fur over me too, and I would sleep in my militsa. They would usually take their militsas off, the mm -hmm. nomads, and they would just sleep under the, the fur blankets. What are you sleeping on top of? They have a fur blanket on the ground too, and you sleep on top of that, and you have a fur blanket over you. Okay. And then they have, uh, so they have the the dogs. The uh, what, what kind of dog is that again? Samoyed. Samoyed. It's uh, a Samoyed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which they use to round up the reindeer, and so there's one adult dog that lived. It would stay inside the tomb at nighttime. And they had puppies, three little puppies, or two little puppies, Samoy puppies. The, the first morning when I woke up, the puppies were sleeping down by my feet. They'd crawled in. I was yeah. so tired, I didn't even notice. I yeah, just woke up and I'm like, I'm like, what is this? What's going on down here by my feet? What's moving around down there? And I heard some squealing and then I realized it's puppies that are sleeping by my feet oh, to stay delightful. warm. Yeah. Yeah, because it's freezing for them, so. Yeah, every night they went down into my sleeping bag and slept on my feet, huh. which I thought was kind of cool, like little things like that. Hey, where, take it, yeah. right? It's extra yeah. warmth. So do they, like, does the family, like, uh, kind of all pile up to conserve warmth? So the women, they don't have the sleeping bag, right? So the women sleep on one side of the tomb and the men sleep on the other side. And they do, you probably, yeah, you kind of, you sleep next to each other, like, 
my friend was next to me, not too far away, and uh, the other nom nomad man and the dad and his son would sleep. We're all like in a row, but they mm -hmm. separate. There's like a, uh, it's like a unwritten rule or a kind of a protocol to where you can sleep. They have a lot of cultural norms that are that they they kind of abide by. They have a no spooning and, rule. <laughs> no, it sounds I mean, like it, right? Because they they still sep separately. I would imagine that whole families in a pile. Right? They're, they weren't in a pile. I w you would think so, right? But yeah, it wasn't like that, no. Yeah. There was one night where the husband and wife were, you know. Making babies. Get, yeah. <laughs> on, making on, babies on, our side of, on our side of the tomb. Yeah. And I heard it and just ignored it. <laughs> it's too cold to deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, you know, you got to keep going, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a way of life, you know. It's like the kids are still there in the tomb, but it's like it's a it's a very, you know, they live in very close living arrangements. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an exception that they're making to make. Uh, I mean, they're they're able to make or willing to make, I guess. Yeah, of course. So what did you do during the day when these guys were out there like herding up reindeer? Because you know they're working up a sweat, they're staying warm. Like, what what were you guys up to? So I I tried to go with them one time. Mm -hmm. to round up the reindeer. And I had planned to go with them all day outside. I realized after like 30 minutes or so that that was not going to be possible. It wasn't so much because I was cold. My body wasn't cold. The reindeer, that Melissa kept my body warm. It's my face. Mm -hmm. So you have a hood on. I mean, you basically are a reindeer. You got like little hoofs, like little paws and you, the, the, it's like the leather interior and the outside is a fur yeah. and they're padded feet and you have padded hands it's like mittens and you got this big hood that goes over your face but your face is exposed and I had like a, I had a face covering but still the cold air was so like brutal in my eyes and just breathing it into my lungs and it was hard to stay out for very long hmm. Because just breathing, I'm not used to this, right? Just breathing, yeah. it was hard. So I'd go for 30 minutes at a time. And we had, like, we had planned to travel across the Sea of Ob, which would have been like a five-hour journey to this huge encampment of Nenets. Mm -hmm. And we decided, no way we're going to do that. Just, you didn't want to get back in that yeah. sledge, huh? I didn't want to do that. There's just no way. But we did travel like an hour to another encampment uh -huh. one day. And we visited another group of, of families that were, that were living in tombs. And we just show up and we'd, we'd drink vodka. They would make some tea and we'd eat some raw reindeer meat and some fish. And, and they always had these like biscuits too. These weird like, like Is that what they sugar were candy and biscuits. Weirdly enough, they always had the same sugar candy and biscuits. And that was like the dessert. So what were they, they were cooking biscuits? Because you, you keep saying they that were they, cooking it. So they what they would do is they would thawing the reindeer meat. And then okay, so when they when you drink water there, you always drink it boiled as tea. Okay, because they take snow and they boil it into mm -hmm. water. So the water you drink is always hot, and they would always make it into tea. We drank a lot of tea, and I thought it was weird. I'm look I'm here in the middle of the. Siberian Arctic, drinking tea from Sri Lanka. I'd see little packets and be like, made in Sri Lanka huh. or grown. And it would take me to warm tropical places and I would wander off and yeah. <laughs> like, God, I just want to go somewhere tropical. I'm never going somewhere cold again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so, so you, you did some expeditions out there, but so you'd, you'd, vent, you'd basically, uh, you'd be in the tomb all day, and you'd take off for 30 minutes and try to jet out there and I'd see go as out, much as you could. Yeah, I'd go out, and I'd wander around, and I'd take pictures and, and, and try, to, try to see as much as I could. There's nothing to see, though. You wander off in the tomb. As far as you can see, it's flat. Just flat, white no, snow. There's nothing. Just an endless horizon. So are these reindeer basically hanging out next to the tombs? Like, what? how, how do the reindeer so stay around So one day... Them? The first day we were there, the reindeer weren't there. And so I they're just think off in the distance. It was somewhere. like the third day. I remember I heard a bunch of like 
moaning and groaning. And, I, and then when the sun rose, I went outside. It was like a thousand reindeer outside around that the many. tomb. Huge herd of them. And so they stayed there all day that day. And then I think maybe the next day, the, the men, they took them and they went somewhere else and they were gone. We didn't see the reindeer. They were, they were like, there was a, a small group. There's one, there's like a, some of the reindeer are sacred reindeer, like these white ones that they kind of just leave and they pamper them and they hang around the tomb. There, there were some of those, but the main group was gone. I didn't see them again, but there's a few of them that would hang around. And how do they take care of the reindeer? Because you said they pamper these, these white reindeer that are sacred, right? The sacred ones. Are they like feeding them or are they just... They feed them. They don't, they don't them? actually eat them. All the rest of them, they will raise them until eventually they will they'll either eat them themselves. They, so the reindeer are all sacred, I should say, to them. Because they are, if it wasn't for the reindeer, they would have, their existence would cease to be a thing. They would not be able to live out there. Mm-hmm. Everything, I mean, they eat the reindeer, they use the fur to keep warm, they use the, the fur, the hides for their houses, they use it for the lassos, to, for fabric, for, I mean, to, to, for sewing, everything. Like, they use the antlers, they sell the antlers to China for income, as the antlers are gr- grinded up into a powder, which is like an aphrodisiac or like a Viagra type medicine in, yeah. in Asia. Um, reindeer are very sacred to them. They have a deep respect for them. But there's a certain group of reindeer where they don't actually kill them. They, it's almost like, they, I think they believe that they are, yeah, after they die, they're reincarnated into, into a reindeer. I could be wrong. I mean, there's a lot of things that I don't know about their culture and their religion. But I think they believe that these sacred reindeer are like reincarnated nenets. So they hmm. pamper them, and sometimes they'll even take them into the tomb with them. Hmm. They don't, well, they still actually kill them, but only, a, <laughs> only, <laughs> only after they're, they're so old that they can't survive on their own anymore. Right. Whereas for the other reindeer, they'll, they'll kill them at any point, wherever, you know, when they decide they're hungry, or they'll sell them, they may kill them to sell the meat. Huh. They'll take them into the village, and they'll slaughter them, and they'll sell the meat which is then sold to, to Russia. Russia, there's a big demand for uh, reindeer meat. It's very good, it's very healthy actually. There's not a lot of fat in it. Yeah? Yeah, it's, it's a very good meat. So I, I, I have another question. So what were they cooking on the stove? Because you, so they made tea on the stove. Fish, so they would cook. Uh, a lot of times we would still eat it very cold though. So really w- with the stove, they would just cook tea and thawed the raw meat to eat? They would thaw it a little bit, but we still ate it pretty, it wasn't like a bar, it wasn't barbecued or anything like that. Yeah. It was pretty cold when we ate it. Um, they and thawed that out, They would thaw it, it out a little it was bit. it pretty good. Like you didn't have a problem with the palate or anything? Like, like man, I really got to figure out how to stomach this. I, I wasn't too picky when I was out there. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was rough. It was really rough. And... Um, the food wasn't that great, but just the experience. It was uh-huh. so exotic being out there with them. Just my only goal was to observe their way of life, to see how they lived, and to not interfere with their lifestyle at all. I, I, I mean, I knew just by being there I would interfere, but I tried to minimize my interference, me and my, my friends, you know, we, as much as possible. Yeah. And, and were they, did you, did you see that they were pretty, like, tuned in with their environment like totally like you said, totally like, yeah sounds like if you were out there you would have died pretty quick right i remember and, and you said that <laughs> you're like completely dependent on them but they're they're just living their life even when we left like when i would go outside if you have to go outside to pee or whatever like that they had this big flap and there was a certain protocol for leaving for departing the tomb and if you didn't do it properly the temperature inside the tomb would dip down an extra 22 degrees below the, what it should be if you were to exit properly. So there was a, there was a strategy to it. And the first like five times I did it, I did it improperly and I got scolded really badly by the mother. And it wasn't the men, it was always the mother and I didn't understand what she was saying, but I knew that I screwed up. I could tell by her tone. Yeah. And, and nobody, nobody ever translated it, but I knew. 
Yeah. And then finally, I think one of the, I think the mother just grabbed me and, and showed me how to do it. Yeah. And explained to me exactly how to do it. There was a strategy, you go from the left side, the left corner, you gotta dip down, and you just barely make a little fold and you go out that way. Huh. Before that, I, because it's kind of hard to, to kneel down on the ground because your knees are frozen, your joints are frozen. Huh. I, I tried to do it standing up instead and I would let too much cold air into the tomb. And of course, you know, wood is very valuable out here. There are no trees. Where are they getting the wood? So they get it from the taiga, from the forest, but it's, they gotta go it's over there hours and get it. away. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the things that they transfer in their, in their sledge. So they had a couple other sledges out there that had like firewood and random things in it. And so they would use the firewood for, for cooking and, and just to warm up every once in a while, but only three times a day, but they would use it very sparingly. So I would see the mother out there sometimes chopping the firewood. And, and yeah. you know, before the advent of snowmobiles, right, were they pulling around these sledges with reindeer, I assume? So that's, so the snowmobiles are mostly to tra for transportation for the, for the nenets. They don't typically pull the sledges, the reindeer do. Hmm. When they move camp, the reindeer will pull the sledges, they'll, they'll take the tomb and they'll fold it up and they'll take everything and they'll put it in the back of the sledge and the reindeer will pull, will pull it. The people will, tra will travel on, sometimes on the sledge with, on the back, but also on the, on, on the snowmobile. And most of the snowmobiles are like these like handmade Soviet looking like MacGyvered contraptions that are just scary to look at. Like, you know, they it break down. It was a toaster and, they, and now it's a snowmobile. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I don't even know, I mean, it's amazing the things that they create over ah. there in, in Russia. And just under the Soviet times, they, they had to innovate. And to this day, they still do not just with snowmobiles, but with a lot of these, with cars even, you know, and yeah. airplanes. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So, so how long did you spend with them overall? I spent maybe a week, six, seven days. And so while I was there, like I, a lot of visitors would come and go. Like one day I remember seeing this guy traveling just in the horizon, I saw this, do this dot getting larger. It was just a guy with, this time he didn't have a reindeer coat, he had a full Arctic fox coat. And he was on his sledge and it was being pulled by reindeer, not a snowmobile. And he was traveling by reindeer and he looked like Santa Claus. He had his beard and it was full of ice. And he was like an Asian Santa Claus or like a, like a Inuit looking Santa Claus. And, and he showed up and this was like when I was outside wandering around and I, I saw him and I thought he was an illusion at first and then he came up to me and he, and he just had this big warm smile. And he gave you gifts. He's really friendly. <laughs> He's super friendly and he, I remember he like put his hand on my shoulder and, and he probably didn't know who I was or what I was doing there. He was just kind of happy to see me. I was probably really exotic to him. And so this happens a lot. And, it, and throughout my time with this family and the other family that we went and visited, people travel from camp to camp and they visit, they share stories, they talk about politics, they do everything that normal people do. At one point, a group of Nenets showed up and told us Cesar Chavez died. Hmm. Uh, uh, Chavez died, Cesar Chavez. Um, Hugo, 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 Hugo Yeah, <laughs> sorry, Hugo Chavez yeah. of uh, Venezuela died. And that was the news that they brought into the camp. Yeah. It, which I didn't know about. It. They say, hey, he died. They heard about it and they brought it to the camp and, and they, were, they were sad about that. And, they, and then they saw us and they're like, who are these guys? And we're like, Americans. And they were like, we've never seen Americans before. And they wanted to see our faces. They were all excited to see Americans. They wanted to know what they look like. And then they, they said, are you gonna put, are you gonna, are you gonna put an American flag outside of our tomb to claim this territory afterwards. You know, that was, that was their statement to us. You know, that's what they thought Americans do. They just go and yeah, conquer, conquer and, and plant claim flies. the land. Yeah. 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 That's, that's fascinating. So 
There was no like radios. They didn't have radios they, or like there was no or radio short so wave to receive. They like, had a they had a satellite phone that didn't work that you, they just got. I don't think it was charged. Mm -hmm. They had just gotten one, but most families didn't have one yet. So they still rely on. And by now, maybe they all have satellite phones. And, and I was surprised, you know, being that this is the number one, one of the number one reserves of natural gas in the world. Why didn't they have, uh, you know, gas canisters out there? Yeah. Why are they using firewood? But they, they well, didn't. Well, it seems like the it's Russian just, government would maybe, you know, if it was me, if I was running the government and I was the Russian government concerned about security, I'd give all those guys satellite phones. And then I'd tap them, you know. But, I mean, it, it's a... If anybody goes out there, right, if anybody's out there, the Nenets are going to know about them. So right. you give them satellite phones and you're like, hey, do us a favor, call if you see anybody weird. And they'll probably call. <laughs> but if they don't call, they'll probably call their buddy and they'll probably tell them about the, and then, you know, since I don't think the Russian government has a problem tapping cell phones, especially right, ones right, that they right. give for free, <laughs> it seems like it'd be a great intelligence opportunity that they're missing out on. But, well, the, the, so one satellite phone is all you saw, and, and, yep, and it was probably yep. dead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they had just gotten that. Hmm. So, but by now, I mean, this is, like I said, six years ago or so, they might all have satellite, I mean, who knows, maybe they have cell phone towers everywhere but now. No, but no just like two-way radios <laughs> nope, to talk between. No two-way radios, nothing like that. Because I bet like the, you know, when they say this, this radio goes like 40 miles, I think those are the conditions under which it goes 40 miles. You know, if it's it, flat and there's nothing between the two points. It's, you know, it's, it's really remote out there and they're moving around all the time. And they actually, so I was, in the wintertime, they're actually closest to civilization. They're, because they come further south. Where the reindeer still graze, there's still some lichen or some grassy type materials below the snow, but just enough for them to graze on to survive. But in the summertime, they go further north where there's actual real grass after all the snow melts. And that's where they, they can go like a thousand miles north. And hmm. up north, there's nothing up there. Hmm. It's really remote. They all have shotguns because once they go up north, they're in polar bear country. Yeah. And even like where we were, every once in a while there's a polar bear that may wander over into that area. How'd they deal with that? They shoot at them. They scare them off. Yeah. Yeah. The polar bear will eat their reindeer, and their I mean, reindeer. The reindeer is them, their life. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That too. But typically, they'll go after the reindeer. I think first. Yeah. Yeah. I never. I, I didn't get into. I never asked them too much about that and what that's like. I don't think it's common that they encounter polar, polar bears. Bear? Yeah. Yeah. But it it happens on occasion. Those things. I mean. I, I encourage you after monsters. the meeting to go. Yeah, they are monsters. Like every once in a while, I tell there's people. There's one right behind me. Oh, it's right there. Or, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's but I mean, we got one in the lobby too. <laughs> but just go there and get close to its face and just imagine that it was alive. Right. It's terrifying. Those things, yeah. you know, like brown bears, like this brown bear here, that could kill you. But it doesn't. It the, doesn't really know it could kill you. The polar the polar bear, bears know that it can. There are documented you. cases of polar bears hunting humans. Nuts. For hundreds of miles. <laughs> it's nuts. Yeah. The most yeah, terrifying awesome. animal on the planet, I think. Yeah. Because, you know, it, sharks or whatever, they're not really interested in you. You know, right. not worried about a shark. Polar bear. If I was in polar bear country, I'd be terrified. And like, like I said, I've encountered a lot of black bears and stuff. Yeah. Black bears are pussies. They run away from you. <laughs> yeah. I know a polar bear wouldn't. A <laughs> polar bear doesn't care. Right, exactly. It's like, oh, do I want to eat that snack or not? And that's the decision that it's mm -hmm. making. A black bear... Is scared of you, but yeah, whew, that's rough. But other than polar bears, which are pretty rare in Nenet territory, except for in the far north, there's really nothing else out there. I know there's the occasional wolf. There's the Arctic wolf too, which is another reason why they have guns to scare off the wolves because they'll eat the reindeer. But um, wolves, you know, over t most of them know better than to try to come into into the areas where the Nenets are and where their herds are because uh -huh. they'll get shot. Right. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. So how'd you get out of this place? How Like, so, same way, sledge? So one more, let me tell you a couple more stories okay. about what it was like being there. So while I was there, like I remember maybe the 
second to the last day. So we're waiting for the men to come back. The men were going to come back with a snowmobile to pick us up. We didn't know exactly what day. I knew that I had a plane to catch eventually, and I had to get back by that day. And so I'm hoping the men will come back, but I also know they don't really have their concept of time is pretty flexible right. compared to mine. And I had serious concerns about them ever coming back to get us on, on a reasonable time frame. And so, um, yeah, one day would pass, another day would pass, and they're like, oh, they're coming today. They would never come. So we, I didn't know what was going on. And then I remember one day, there was a crazy blizzard, whiteout conditions. So I remember going outside to, to pee and to use the bathroom, and I, I couldn't go. Normally, I would go out of respect to the women, and I'd try to go like a couple hundred feet away or 100 yards or whatever. This, I mean, time, this time, I was like, I went like five feet away. <laughs> because beyond that, you couldn't see the chum. Yeah. And this, the wind was so strong, it was whiteout conditions. If you lost your way back to the chum, dead. Dead. Guaranteed dead. And so I went back as quick as possible into the chum, and the, the sides of the chum were flapping violently. It was loud, you could hear the wind screaming, and it was scary. I thought the chum was gonna collapse. And, and, and then it's even said, hey, if it collapses, no big deal. But, you know, every like 20 minutes or so, the women would go outside and they would, with like a big stick, they would dig a trench around the chum and re-support it. They would dig up the snow that would be like, push so it would be blowing up against the side uh -huh. and they would push out away with the, like this big stick or they had like this kind of shovel device and they'd reinforce the chum and keep it from collapsing. And they'd come back inside, and I have a photo of, of the mother who came back in, and her face was full of icicles. And I remember she was like smiling, like, cause she, they know they're badass. Yeah. And they know that we're just fascinated by how strong they are. Yeah. You know, but to them it's nothing. They're not scared. This is This is, is a nothing. picture of a chum. This looks like a fairly, yeah. this isn't white out blizzard, but that's the idea, right? That's the size yeah, of it. That's kind of, yeah, that's kind of like what a chum that looks like an empty one. There's nothing inside, but that's what a chum looks like. It's like a teepee-like structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a question that's... about the the um, the the peeing thing. Like I've been so cold in the tent that I just open up. I just open up the tent and I don't even exit. Right? <laughs> right. The pee exits, but I mean that that's when it's really bad, right? I imagine from what you've told me, this is that bad. If I had that option. <laughs> So what do you do when you need to poop? Well, like, cause okay. you, you went five feet away and peed. I don't have a problem with that. That's not a big well, deal. Most of the time you'd wander that. away to do either or. But here's the thing, nobody told me this. Again, nobody ever tells me anything. Me and my, my buddy, we always discover this stuff on our own. But the reindeer, they would keep an eye on you and they knew when you had to urinate and they were mineral starved, salt starved, uh. right? And so I was out there the first day I was urinating off in the distance, just minding my, my own business. All of a sudden, 10 reindeer come flying at me, all around me, antlers <laughs> fla flailing around my groin. I'm trying to fend them off. I'm grabbing onto their horns, trying to keep from becoming castrated and I had no idea that this would happen. Man, these reindeer and, are into some weird shit here. Yeah. <laughs> so they just want to lick the minerals, the salts yeah, that makes from your sense. urine, right? Because there's nothing out there for them. They're, they're, they're uh, salt starved. And they know exactly what you're doing before you do it. So the and they, start they have this problem too? Or like... They have a stick and they beat <laughs> off the reindeer. And the reindeer know that they're going to do this. And they're pretty violent about it, so the reindeer leave them alone. They don't right. bother them. Yeah. yeah, but you, they're like, this guy doesn't have the stick. Right. He, he doesn't have the stick. Let's go get him. <laughs> and one side of the chum is where the women go, and the other side is where the men go. And so, yeah, if you're urinating, the reindeer will come after you. They pick it up right away. You. They, so, pick, they know right away. Okay. And I, I felt like they knew we were tourists, so they knew we didn't know how to defend ourselves. Yeah. Like, easy prey. Right. So, but the hard then, stuff. What about the hard stuff? So, well, first of all, just to take, like, you don't have a zipper right. on this reindeer fur coat thing. Right. Right? So you have to, 
it's not easy just to urinate. Yep. It's a huge process. And I remember one time, the wind, so I'm ready to urinate. The wind, I'm always trying to do it away from the wind, obviously. The wind shifted, blasted me, and I got a quick little bit of frostbite on my, you know. Like, yeah. It was so cold. You do not want to expose any flesh to this I've got to ask you something. For, Did you not poop for seven days when you were out there? <laughs> there was one That's time. That's an option, right? One time. <laughs> you had to poop once you, in you, seven days? You try to avoid it. You try to avoid it for sure because it is not, obviously, that's going to be more involved, yeah. right? You try to avoid it, but inevitably, you got to go at least one time. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, I know people that are like, I'm holding it for seven days. You and know? the reindeer don't care about that. Yeah? The dogs do. What do you mean? The dogs will go out there and eat it. Ah, uh, <laughs> even the, ne the nettets? The same dogs that were licking your face every day up until that point. And then you're like, oh God, this, these dogs They're eating are eating feces. Food. Yeah, everybody's. everybody's feces and now, and they've been licking my face every day. So did they tell you to ear. bury it or, or no, they like, no, yeah, just, just let the dogs eat it? You don't have to bury it. The dogs, <laughs> the dogs will go out there and gobble it up. Follow you out there just like the reindeer? Yep, yep. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the reindeer don't care about the feces. Dogs do. They gobble it right up. It just got real. This is some serious... <laughs> This is the wild, right? It, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it's desperate measures out there, I guess. You know? That's nuts. Everybody's living on the edge. I'd say. <laughs> every animal, every creature. Yeah. So, so what other stories do you have for the camp before you, before you tell us about how you, how you got out, right? Because, I mean, you had to rely on them to get out, too. Because if, if, if you had to get out on your own, so the, no I way. remember, like, well, I have a lot of stories. I mean, it's the, like, I remember one of the, the tents next to us, the tombs next to us, they had a newborn baby in a cradle, full on like reindeer fur, like, like the cradle is surrounded by reindeer fur. It was a newborn baby, it was a young couple. And we talked to them a little bit and we asked them, I remember asking them, my friend is big into shamanism. He's like, he's like a shaman, my, my buddy, he's part Native American and he's asking a lot of questions about shamanism. He's very curious. Now, it's don't like to talk about their religion. It's a very personal thing. And keep in mind, they, they survived the Soviet era where all of that stuff was discouraged. So, you know, born out of that, they have a, a deep suspicion of outsiders when it comes to people asking about the religion and some of their more like the personal aspects of, of their culture. So they didn't really want to talk about that. And I remember like they didn't even want me to take a picture of their baby because it's, it's bad luck to take a picture of the baby and it could bring death. They believe it could potentially take, bring death upon the baby. They did let me take a photo eventually, but only when the baby was covered up. But they, had a, they have like a, these little miniature like reindeer sledges that are like holy or sacred to them. And we asked, I knew about that because my, my other friend who was guiding us told me about that. And we asked them if, we, if they had that. And they told us it was disrespectful to ask about that. And they didn't want to talk about that at all. It's like a little miniature model of mm -hmm. a reindeer sledge with like little miniature figures of reindeer. Mm -hmm. And they hide it back in the back of their tomb. And I was kind of fascinated by that. And to them, it's sacred, and it's sort of, it's a place that embodies spirits. Like, they're, they're animistic. They have different spirits that are like animals and kind of Native American similar type religions. Um, so we really didn't, we weren't able to really talk about the religion much, unfortunately. But you know, the, that was What was the their, purpose of the sled? That was like a, uh, an altar or like It's a, kind of like an altar. I don't really know the details behind it, but it's an altar. It's something that they just, it's very near and dear to their hearts. They wouldn't really talk about it, it too much. Is it supposed to represent their, their family? Like I think so. Yeah, like their family. Yeah, hmm. it's like, it's an embodiment of spirits that protect their family. Hmm. Yeah, and they didn't, they didn't want to show it. You didn't see it, though. We didn't see it. They didn't want to show it to but us. You knew it was there. I knew it was there. Yeah. Huh. So that was one story. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, there was just interactions with people that would come and go that were interesting. We drank a lot of vodka. There was one night where what the- What kind of vodka do they have? Is it like moonshine? Or are they buying really like regular stuff? Cheap, and- really cheap. So they get it in the village. So like a plastic bottle with a plastic cap? Really cheap stuff. Yeah. Awful. <laughs> they yeah. get it in the village and then they stock up on it. So when they go out into the tundra, they probably have a, you know, like a, a full, like, uh, you know, sledge full of vodka bottles. I don't know. Because they seem to have a never any supply of this stuff. <laughs> and I, I was fascinated by their supply. I'm like, where do you keep, I didn't even know where they kept it all. Yeah. Maybe it was outside in a sledge, but they always had one. And as soon as they bust open a bottle, when they open it up, you knew that it's not like you just sip a little bit and you put it away. When they open it, you don't stop until that bottle is finished. Hmm. And for breakfast, I'm not a big drinker in the morning. You know, drinking vodka is yeah. not appealing to me in the morning. I, I imagine they didn't bust out a Bloody Mary for you, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Every morning we had, especially when the men were there, it was kind of a nice break when the men left, when we were just, me and my 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 buddy and our guide were left there with the women because we didn't drink any vodka. The women didn't drink vodka. It was yeah. just the men. But when they came back, remember that night, we drank a lot of vodka that night. And we drank like two bottles of it. It was bad. And my one friend got really drunk and he was talking a lot of gibberish. Uh-huh. And at one point, the Nenet dad was like, you got to tell him to shut up. <laughs> it was translated to us. He's like, tell him to shut up, or we're going to put you guys outside tonight. <laughs> and, and again, I don't know if there's, you know, they, they joke around, but sometimes they're serious. Yeah. And I'm or like, you don't know. You're like, oh. <laughs> And I, I told my friend, I'm like, you got to shut up. We're going to go outside, and we're going to freeze to death out there. Right. You shut the hell up. Like, <laughs> and he did. He, he shut up. He went to sleep. And Yeah. You know, and then the next day we, we left, not in the morning like I intended. But we left sometime around noon. Very and, much on their schedule throughout yeah, this. Yep, yep. And there were no, the weird thing is there were no goodbyes. Nobody said goodbye. Families didn't say goodbye to us. No hugs or anything like that. Yeah. They're not a goodbye kind of culture. Yeah. It didn't mean that, you know, I think they enjoyed having us around. Like, we shared a lot of stories. They asked us what San Diego was like. Told them about my travels to some exotic places, other cultures. Told them about like tribes in Africa and in, in, in the Amazon. And they're fascinated by different animals, whales and things like that. And I would tell their, their kids and it was, I, I like sharing these stories with them. And mm-hmm. so they kind of opened up over, over the days with us. And you know, they, I think they were sad to see us go, but they didn't show it. Yeah. There's no goodbyes, no hugs, nothing like that. No you know, emails exchanged, no. You brought up, you brought up something. You said, you said you told them about San Diego, right? I yeah. thought, how, how warm does it get in the summer times up there? It, 80 degrees? I mean, it can no, get no, warm. No, no, not 80. That's super warm. Actually, it did get to 80 degrees, and that was a record high, and that was the summer. And that, that is, like, unheard of up there. Usually it's... The warmest it gets is like in the 50s, I think. Hmm. And it can get, even in, in the height of summer, it can get down to like 30, 20 degrees. It's entirely possible. It could snow any time of the year. But how there. do you explain that? Because, you know, when, when you tell, I've never been a negative 50. I might never be, an, I, I would like to go negative 50 to, I, to see what it's like, but I've never been to negative 50. What do you think it's like telling them, like, what's San Diego like? Well, most days <laughs> right. of the year, it's 80 degrees or 75 degrees. Like every it, day of like the year, it's like trying to tell you what, like you what it's like to be in negative 50. You know, trying to I've tell them in, what it's I've like to be. I've been in zero, and I know zero is nowhere that I want to be. So I can't. Well, even you've imagine. been in cold, yeah. right? So you have some idea. They've never been in warm. They never. Yeah, they've never been anywhere warm. You know, like like you can sit outside. Yeah. So, with a bikini on, and you don't die. <laughs> I tried to explain to them what it was like at 100 degrees, you know, and they were just, their minds were blown by it. Huh. They were fascinated. And I told them about the ocean, I told them I like to surf and what it's like to ride waves. And, and so stories like that are, I, I love to exchange, 
And that's kind of why we travel, right? To exchange mm-hmm. ideas and, and to learn from each other. And so they were really curious about a lot. And I had some pictures on my, my phone that I would show them. Show them pictures of Paula, pictures of my friend had a boat. Showed them my friend's sailboat. They were fascinated by that. Yeah. And, you know, my house, things like car. So it, I would it was be, cool to... You know, just, I would be fascinated, like kind of thinking about how... They, I would be fascinated to see people outside in shorts and a T-shirt. Yeah. You know, yeah, because I, we see people bundled up and we're like, yeah, it's cold. And I don't think it's the same impact, right? They, like, because they literally probably have to be bundled up for their entire lives unless they well, keep in mind too, way. even in the summer, okay, for them it gets warm up. I mean, they're acclimatized to the, to the cold. Yeah. In the summertime, it's warm enough where they could probably go out and like, I don't know, in their underwear or something like that. But this is the tundra in the Arctic. There are swarms of mosquitoes, oh. like clouds, like you can't even imagine. This is a big reason why I decided to go in the winter. I decided I'd rather brave the cold than deal with the mosquitoes. Yeah. Plus, if you go in the winter time, they're closer to the towns. It's easier to find them in the summertime. It's, it's harder to travel over land, and they're further north, and they're yeah. harder to reach. So it's, it's more uh, feasible to, to find them in the, in the wintertime. Hmm. So did you have any issues getting back? Or like you knew what that sledge ride was going to be back? Going back was no problem. We actually, and this is another thing too, I knew about going during the day. There would probably be other nenets out traveling. Because they actually, believe it or not, they have some kind of a highway that they travel. I, to me, it all looks the same. Mm-hmm. The tundra looks identical. And even at nighttime, when I asked the Nenet, the, the dad, I'm like, how do you know where to go? He's like, I follow the stars. Because the snow all looks the same. And, and he's like, I follow the, the land formations. I'm like, what land formations? Huh. But to him, there's a geographical map. And he, he knows how to travel. Like, right. he uses everything that's, that's available to him. Stars, I don't know. Slightest little bumps in the, the horizon. He knows where to go. And they all kind of travel in the same path, right? Between camps and to the villages. And you see random like snowmobile tracks going off into the middle of nowhere. But they also do, like there is more of a cluster, more of a high, higher concentration of snowmobile tracks on these areas that they, they do travel to the village. And so we would, we took that path and then we'd bump into other nenets that are traveling in snowmobiles with their sledges. We normally would stop. They would talk to each other. They would, they always bust out a bottle of vodka. We'd Down share another it. bottle of vodka. The nenets would be like, other nenets, nomads, would, they'd be fascinated by us. They would come over and they want to talk to us. And I remember an, another group of like, I want to see what an American looks like. Lift up your, lift up your ski mask underneath your hood. I want to see what. <laughs> you just like, like cower. They're yeah. like, oh, that's what American looks like. Like, ah. Oh. <laughs> and they and, and they were really nice. They invited us back to their tomb. They're like, hey, you want to come back with us to our tomb and stay with us? And I'm like, thank you, but no. <laughs> we're ready to go. We're ready to go home and get. So the were heck there out even here. like mountains in the distance that you could see? Completely flat. It was flat as a. As far as you can see. Years later, I flew over the Yamal from Dubai, going back to LA, and it was a different perspective. But I could see exactly how flat it was from 30, 40,000 feet. There's nothing, hmm. no mountains, no hills, nothing. It is completely flat during the entire length of the Yamal Peninsula. Wow. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's really remote and desolate out there. Just an endless, flat expanse of, of tundra. But there's enough the stuff for, for reindeer to eat. Reindeer can yeah. get in there and yep. eat some yeah. lichen or grass. Grass, or whatever. lichen. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that... So all the... I talked about the natural gas, the mining. They have drills out there. They have pipelines. It's disrupting the mi- migratory pattern of the reindeer. Mm-hmm. And a lot of reindeer are dying from it. Really? And it's poisoning the, 
the, the grass because there's leaking, there's leakage, there's other chemicals too that they use for mining and everything and it leaks into the tundra. And I know that the nomads are not very happy about that. Right. The Russian government tries to appease them by giving them free health care, even giving them free houses, which they, most of them choose not to live in. They'd rather right. be nomadic. It's how they've lived for a thousand years. And they've even tried to pay them to live in their houses. They choose not to. So a lot of the nomads are, are upset because the reindeer are dying now because of all of the mining that's occurring up there. And a lot of the permafrost is melting as well because yeah. of global warming. And everybody up there told me the same. They're like, hey, it's changing up here. We've lived here for many generations. We know the land. The land is changing. Global warming is a real thing. They, they knew about global warming. Right. So any, anybody they who tries, know where they're ranging. People here in the United States, they'll, they'll, everybody claims to be an expert on it. We live in cities. I've lived with tribes all around the world. I've stayed with tribes. Uh, and they all tell me the same. Global warming is a real thing. Our way of life is threatened. We have yeah. a real change here. It is getting harder for us to live like we have lived for right. generations. Yeah. So. Yeah, because their, their range changes. I do wonder, though, about the pipeline thing. And I've always wondered this, right? Because especially how you describe the tundra up there. So hundreds of miles of nothing in either direction. It's not nothing. You know, reindeer can herd there. So you, sl you slap a pipeline in the middle of it, like right? right down the middle. And I get it. The pipeline leaks, and it right. pollutes the environment, and that, that is a problem, you know. And, and, but say it like, it, it doesn't leak everywhere, but say it, say it leaks like a mile wide in each direction. Like, is it really that much of a, of a, of a uh, bad thing on the environment? Because, again, there's a lot of nothing out there, and then you, you slash a pipeline yeah, through yeah. it. And, you know, we think it, it sounds bad, like, I'll admit it, right? You, you, you drove this pipeline right through the middle. But even if you take out a mile in each direction of that, like the reindeer can go through. They like, or they like stopping and they're like, oh, it's oil. Let's, let's, let's eat some or, and get poisoned. I don't know the exact what? details or science behind it, but from what it, this is what they told me. They were pretty angry and pretty worked up about it. I told them that I have a job in the environmental field. Mm -hmm. And so they were interested in that because that's, that's mind blowing to them, any kind of job in the environmental field in Russia. And so they told me that, like, basically there's leaking of these chemicals, and I think it gets into the water table and it spreads out. Hmm. And it gets into the, the grasses, the lichen, the, whatever it is that the reindeer feed on and poisons them. So they are, eat, like, the, the reindeer are migrating. Because, again, like, I, you know, when I've hiked, I've hiked across pipelines. I'm like, oh, this looks fine, and I keep hiking. So it sounds like what you're saying is the reindeer, you know, they cross that path, but they're eating something yeah. while they're there that's yep. polluted or something, and that, that pollution is poisoning them. It's poisoning them, yep. Interesting. So really what we need to do to fix the pipeline thing is stop the pipeline from leaking. Because I feel like if it, if it was just a pipe, like it would be weird, and reindeer would look at it, and uh, like this is weird, and then keep walking. But... It sounds like the poisoning is the real issue because of the leakage. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to get. I, I'm not saying that natural gas mining is a bad thing, and and maybe the Russian government is trying to work in harmony with the Nenets. This is just what I'm saying is just based on what the Nenets told me. Yeah, they weren't happy about it, and maybe things are different now, six years later. <laughs> I doubt it. Probably not. <laughs> Probably for the worse. I know. The Russian solution to this problem is to encourage all the Nenets to abandon their nomadic lifestyle and to move into the villages. And this is every government solution pretty much in the world exactly. when it comes to nomads. Governments don't like nomads. Yeah. They don't pay taxes. <laughs> and yeah. they move around. They like to keep track of their populations. Yeah. The best way to keep track is when you have them living in a fixed location. Well... The other thing, too, because, I don't know, if I, if I was a government, I wouldn't really care about these people that aren't paying taxes. They're not hurting. They're not, they're, they don't help. They don't hurt. Whatever. They do their own thing. They're not, it's mm -hmm. not like they're using services, right? But I would be concerned that 
any, like, there's this, because to be nomadic, like, like a wolf, right? Yeah. A, one wolf needs this gigantic swath of land. If, the, if you want them to live how they were intended to live, how they lived for thousands of years, they need a lot of acreage, you know, hundreds of square miles. Right. And if that's disturbed, you're disturbing their way of life. So that's the hard part, right? Because now, all of a sudden, all this, all these square miles, right? If I, if I really want to let these people live how they've always lived, I can't do anything in there. Because and, and anything will disrupt it. And, and you're right. And the reindeer have to move constantly. Yeah. Otherwise, they will starve to death. Yeah. So there is a, the caloric value of of the, the lichen and the moss that exists out in the tundra is very small. So they have to constantly move and they have to prevent overgrazing too. If they stay in one area, they'll overgraze. So they have to, they have to continuously move yeah. from one area to the next. And that's why they weren't around for very long when I was at the, at the encampment that I was at. They took the, the reindeer and they moved them to a, a new location. Do you think they just brought the reindeer in so you could see them, just for you guys? <laughs> no, no. I, they brought them in. I, I don't know why they. I don't know exactly why they brought them in, but they brought them in and they separated. So the day, I don't think they did anything for our sake. They they really honestly didn't care less that we were there. <laughs> like, what I, was the benefit to having you there? Did, did they get paid or? So we did give them some money. We uh -huh. did. We, I, don't know, I don't even know exactly how much we gave them, but we did give them some money in order to host us. And I don't know even if they would have required it because there were plenty of nenets there that invited us back to stay with them for free. Right. So, but it I think it's kind of... It was a cultural exchange, just like it was for Yeah, you. it's like it's kind of rude to not offer something in, any, in exchange. And the best thing for us to offer is money in return. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and my friend arranged, like I said, he knew this family from before. He had traveled up to the Yamal and he had stayed with them for like an entire winter. So he knew them very well. So he had prearranged for our visit to come out and stay with his family. And I think he had told them that we would offer them some money. I probably, I don't know what we would have paid them. $400, $300, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, but significant when you got to keep a snowmobile running and yeah. So know. they they the fuel is expensive for them, and that that's probably their number one cost right there is just the snowmobile fuel. Yeah, they had to pick us up, drive us out there. They did modify their lifestyle somewhat to accommodate us, mm -hmm. and you know when you're living in the fringes like that, I'm, I mean. Every time I visit a tribe or some nomadic culture, I always, in this day of age too, especially, you got to give them some. Mostly, most of the time, you got to give them money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's maybe. Well, I mean, it's pretty impactful, right? I mean, you are yeah. disrupting their life, and and you yeah. know, like four hundred dollars. Yeah. Like if I was living, if I was living out there, and I had to go out there, and someone was like, someone wants to come and tag along, and they're going to give you four hundred bucks. I'm like. Tell them to go piss off. I got better things to deal with, you know? Like, that yeah. wouldn't be enough. But I, I think, you know, like you said, fuel costs, snowmobile upkeep. Like, they do have to work with the outside world, and I'm pr pretty sure that's... So what I think, I've been in touch with my, my friends since visiting, and I think what he tries to do now is he tries to mix up the families. And this is what he told me that his plan, his plan was to, to reduce the cultural impact on any one group of families by mixing up the families so that different families would have a chance to, to have foreigners stay with them. And he wanted to set up some kind of a eco-cultural tourism kind of operation so that people can go out there and exchange their culture and get to know the Nenet way of life with, by, and also by minimizing the impact on them mm -hmm. and their, their daily activities. Man, that's fascinating. So uh, as we get to the end here, we, we've had people, I'm sure, asking tons of questions in the chat. So uh, we like to do a little Q&A at the end, and Andy's queued up over there with people that have, 
I'm sure you've generated tons of questions. This has been fascinating. Andy's waving his arms with a lot of questions in the chat. <laughs> yeah, hello everyone. For, hey, first, did anybody answer our Arctic Circle question? They did. Let me find the name real fast. Uh, we've got so great, we've credit. got fantastic members. You know, I knew someone would be like, yeah. this is what the Arctic Circle is. I'm like, yes, thank you. No, I know there's a lot of members that have extensive yeah. experience with traveling in the Arctic regions and Antarctic. Well, we've got and, Wayne White. And, and put me to shame, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, and Wayne White is a member that. here, right? Huh? Wayne White, you, you know what he does? He runs okay. the South Pole Station. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He so, lives down there like almost uh, three three years or something like that. He's been running that yeah. station down there. So he is the expert in the. I, I, I by no means claim to be an expert on any of this stuff. I'm an amateur adventurer. So uh, far from amateur <laughs> at this point. But Andy, let's let's answer that Arctic Circle question because. Sure. So the answer to the question comes from Thomas Dietz. Thank you for the answer, Thomas, and for the clarification. And he says that the Arctic Circle is where the sun stays at least once per year continuously above the horizon. Ah, that's interesting. So mm. obviously the equator is the middle. The Tropic of Capricorn and Cancer are the furthest the sun transits up, right? Right. And then yeah. um, the Arctic Circle never disappears. Like the at least once it, it stays in the sky the whole time. That's pretty cool. Which means I think the the antithesis of that is that at least once a year you never see the sun one day, yeah, right? Yeah. The Arctic Circle is the Arctic and Antarctic Circle are pretty cold places. Like I, I've been to the Arctic Circle three times, I think, on this trip. Again in Spitsbergen, an archipelago of islands, way up there by Greenland and north of Norway in the Arctic Ocean. And then again, and in the north of Alaska, where I went and stayed with the Inuit up in uh, where there's a lot of polar bears in a small village up there. Yeah. Kaktovik, I think it's called. Yeah. You know, another thing that you should think about knocking your bucket list off because you've been in some cold places. You probably haven't been in the cold place, coldest place. But we do have an opportunity in Southern California, especially recently. I think it happened the other day. You could be at the hottest place on the planet, <laughs> the hottest place, the hottest temperature, hottest day of the year that's ever Valley. been Death Valley. I think they just set a new record. <laughs> and I, I, I really want to hit that, you know, like I, to say that, because one day I would like to go to the coldest place on the planet. But I'd like to also say that right. I, I went to the hottest place on the planet on the hottest day but of the I, year. I find that's it ever fascinating to visit people like different cultures that live in these places too, like Death Valley. It's not really anybody that lives there. But if you go to the Danakil Depression in Ethiopia, uh -huh. the lowest point in a desert, and it's hot as hell there. I was there, when I was there, it was like 110. There's a, a tribe of people that live there, the Afar. Mm -hmm. I went there and visited them. And I didn't stay with them. They just traveled around the region, but I, I visited a lot of different families and camps. They live there, and it's fascinating to observe how they adapt. On the flip, flip side of things from the Nenets, who live in the cold, it's fascinating to see how they afar live in the extreme heat, mm -hmm. you know, where they basically wear nothing almost. They have like these skirt, skirts where their, their legs are bare. And they don't have but, like well, some sort of protection from the sun, huh? Ah, they have it like a turban type thing. Uh -huh. that protects their head, but they, well, they're really dark too, and their, their bodies, they physically have acclimatized to that hmm. heat from generations of living like that. But it's fascinating just to see how they live and their adaptations and their physical differences, yeah. just like with the Nenets, you know? Like, and I find that fascinating, just traveling around the world and visiting these different, different tribes and seeing how they've adapted to these different places like the Korowai and Pap Papua. They live in the tropical rainforest and they live in these, these houses that are kind of built up in the trees and, and all, different, all kinds of different tribes. That, yeah. you know, it would be a fascinating study to see the difference physiologically between the Nenets and, and, and the uh, people that live in the Ethiopian desert, right? Mm -hmm. Because, have you seen those pictures that shows like a basketball player versus a gymnast? 
Yeah, yeah. In terms, yeah. like it, it's when when you see a basketball player that's like extremely tall and in shape versus a gymnast who's like four eleven, that that it, and they're both at the pinnacle of their sport, right? But you see that, and you're like, oh my god, like look at the physiological difference right. between these two people. Well, <laughs> like it's crazy. Well, the net, it's none of them are really that tall, right? Uh-huh. And I don't think it pays to be that tall in that kind of cold. Right, um, I went to visit the Mundari tribe in South Sudan. They, they're built like really tough looking people, all like six foot two on average, really tall, taller than me, really built, and they're big, big into wrestling. Yeah. Really strong, really physically fit, uh, very athletic looking people. And all of them, you know, most, athletic looking culture that I've, I've visited in, in any of the tribes I've been to. So it is fascinating to see the physical differences, adaptations of different cultures and tribes yeah. around the world. When you hit those extremes though, because mm-hmm. most people are pretty much the same, like you know, within, within a culture, right? Like within Southern California, everybody's pretty much right in the middle, right? Yeah, but to, to yeah. go to those far extremes and, and compare those two, that's it must be crazy. Yeah. But anyway, let's try to let's try to hit some more of these questions here. Thank you for that answer, uh, Dietz. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for that answer, Thomas. Yeah, uh, we should get rolling because we've got a few here. Uh, first question comes from Bernie Harris, and Bernie wants to know where is somewhere that you have not been yet, and where is on your bucket list? I have not been to. So I'm hoping in November to go to Chad, to the Ineti Oasis area. It's, uh, I haven't been to the country of Chad. I've been to a lot of the Saharan. I've been to all of them except for Chad. Um, Libya, Mali, Mauritania. So I really want to go to Chad. Fascinated by that. It's been, I heard that it's called like the Yemen of Africa. And there's a lot of nomadic cultures there. Just a lot of really raw, amazing Saharan mm-hmm. desert terrain. And this area, the Aneti, had, it's an oasis in this mountain desert area with gigantic saltwater crocodiles that live inside this huh. oasis. And I, I love reptiles, especially crocodiles. And the nomads, they bring all of their camels to this oasis to drink. So I, I've always been fascinated by this. I'd like to see it. Hopefully, COVID permitting, right? I can get there in November. <laughs> so I, I mean, as long as you um, put two weeks on either side of that trip, I think you're good, right? But you know, there, there's, there's a. The more you travel, the more you realize you haven't seen anything. So my yeah. list is never ending. Yeah. There's plenty of more places I want to go to. All right. Next question, Andy. We've got, we've got some questions to get through. we got some questions to get through. And actually, this next question is an amalgamation of a few. So I'll truncate them and, and simply ask from one person. Uh, let me find the name so I can make sure I get it right. Jason McDunn wants to know, kid, do you work out? <laughs> Bro, do you even lift? <laughs> uh, the answer to that is obviously yes. Thank yeah. you, Jason McDunn. You're a surfer, right? Surfing's yeah, a workout. He's one of my buddies, and I didn't even know that I was uh, on this tonight. That's funny. <laughs> uh, well, it looks like you've got a bit of a fan club tonight because DS is also in the chat, and DS <laughs> says biceps are looking good. So, Thank you. So you do lift, bro? <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question, Andy. <laughs> Before we move on, I want to give a very quick shout out to Brian King, who's in the chat, who is joining us from the Democratic Republic of Congo. So, whoa, oh, wow! Looks like we've got fans all over the globe. That's re- that's going to show up as an interesting statistic on our YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> One viewer from DRC. I've been to the DR Congo and I stayed with the Mabuti tribe in the Ituri Forest, great place, and the Virunga National Park. Wow, that's another whole talk. That country, you can spend an entire lifetime exploring that country. Yeah. Yeah. And Jason McDunn, we, we went to Cameroon to the Congo rainforest over there where uh, I was charged by a gorilla. 
We had Alan and. Feldstein on, on, on uh, who runs um, safari tours over there. Okay. And he said that was his favorite, his most favorite experience was, was getting to go see the gorillas. He said it was expensive yeah. too. Do they charge it, extra if you get charged? <laughs> All right, next question, Andy. Next question comes from Thomas Dietz, back in the chat. What is the most interesting thing you learned about the Nenets? The most interesting thing I learned was I was fascinated that they were so cavalier about the cold, the extreme cold. And I remember one of them took me aside and it was translated to me and he's like, we're drinking and he's like, are you afraid of this place? And I'm like, yeah, it's really cold. I'm terrified. And he's like, I'm not. You know, and you know why? Because if I was afraid, I would die. Fear would kill you. Fear kills you. And he's like, the, the cold is not the enemy here. It's, it's your inability to be prepared for the cold. And he's mm -hmm. like, we dress for the cold. We live for the cold. We survive here because we're not afraid of this place. And he told me, he's like, one time my snowmobile broke down and I walked for days in the tundra, in the middle of the winter. And he said he slept under the snow at nighttime. And he's like, I was never afraid. If I was afraid, I would have died. And he's like, because I am confident in my ability to live out here, and we as a culture are confident, we can survive out here. And, and I think that that's true about all these cultures that live in these extreme environments around the world. They're not afraid. They they have this survival instinct, and they're and they're comfortable with living in their environment. And when I visit, I'm not comfortable, and I often push myself to the extremes when I visit them. And I go for a short duration. I know there's a lot of explorers in this club that have gone out to these places and spent maybe months, and maybe maybe longer with some of these tribes. And hats off to them. But I'm okay with just doing it. A shorter visit. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah, I, I get what I need to get from just a shorter visit, but I, I'm just fascinated by learning about their cultures and, and how they adapt to their extreme mm -hmm. environments. And, you know, their cultures are all changing. They're abandoning, and I've seen this, this is a common theme, people are abandoning their traditional lifestyles and moving to the city, joining Instagram, joining global culture and everybody's becoming the same and that's sad <laughs> it's an opiate right globalization it, it is an opiate breaks my and heart all the social media <laughs> and all that stuff yeah. yeah all right next question andy next question is from scott crawford thank you for the question scott and thanks for tuning in scott wants to know did he find the keys <laughs> yeah he found the keys but I don't know if he ever lost the keys or if he was, he messing, was messing with, with me. You. And I found out later on that they're able to hotwire all snowmobiles anyways. Yeah. Yeah, they can MacGyver anything. Right. Like I said, they're not afraid. Yeah. All right, next question. Next question comes from Scott Crawford again. He wants to know, were you eating for three meals a day, reindeer and fish? Yes. Yeah. I, you know, it was... I didn't eat a lot. My appetite wasn't at its peak. Uh, I, I drank more than I think I ate, not just vodka, but tea. And it, I ate a lot of those little biscuit things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like those biscuits. They're like uh, sugar powder biscuits. Whatever they were, they were pretty good. You didn't bring any food with you though, huh? Not, you didn't have, like, not, some really, not really, because when I travel on the airplane, I usually only carry, only have a carry-on. So I was kind of limited, especially with all my cold weather gear and everything. I couldn't carry a lot of food. Hmm. Uh, I, I did bring some things, yeah. Yeah, not, not too much, though. Should have brought some whiskey. Like, Be like, I know you guys yeah, like the vodka, but yeah. you got to try this stuff. They would have loved it. I bet. Yeah. I mean, it does the same job, right? But it's a different right. color and a different flavor. Yeah. Yeah. All right, next question, please. All right, the next question uh, has been asked several times, so I feel the need to address it here. 
Next question, originally asked by Matthew Shaw, <laughs> is how much shrinkage occurred? I'm guessing this is in reference to the bathroom. <laughs> And did you let the reindeer lick your schlort? <laughs> it's like a scared turtle, right? All right, these guys are all my friends, obviously. <laughs> He's just trying to embarrass me. Um, well, you can imagine at 50 below zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of shrinkage. I'm pretty there's, much cool with whatever shrinkage they, is necessary I, at that there's, point. There's like, uh, I, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to talk about shrinkage because yeah. I don't want to give any ideas to... Anyways. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to tell my junk. It's, if I was in that situation, just all the way back. Like, retreat, it, take care of your yourself. Your junk is we'll angry. See you, we'll see you in a couple when you, months when, you, when I'm back in San Diego. When you, you know? when you expose your junk in that kind of temperature, it's very angry. Yeah. And it, it it's protesting. So. Yeah. And then I'll, you got I'll those reindeer coming after and you. What was the other, the last bit? Oh, about the reindeer. You ever, they, they ever get close enough? Never get too there, close. Nothing unnatural occurred with the reindeer. Okay. We'll leave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the Russian government's going to come after you. <laughs> <laughs> it's still illegal, <laughs> even in Russia. All right, next. Next question is, what were the day-night hours like? Uh, that's a good question. I think you said like five hours, but like... Was that the sun standard? would rise around like 11 a.m. <laughs> it was, and then the sun would set around like 4 p.m. <laughs> So the the daylight was very brief. How okay? So you said you got out of the tent for thirty minutes at a time. How long did you have to go back in the tent before you could go out for your next? I, so I would go out a lot during the day. I would go out multiple times because I just wanted to get out and move. But yeah, when I would go back in, I would stay inside for like an hour, and I would try to, I would try to read or just I don't know talk to the nenets. Not die. I couldn't read because my hands were too cold to turn the pages. Jeez. So it was hard to read. And so a lot of times we just sit there and stare at the wall. And, <laughs> and the nettits too, like a lot of times they were just too, they wouldn't do anything. They would just sit there and we just all stare at each other and not talk. There's, there's a uh, lot of uh, downtime where we would just do nothing. It, it, it was dull at times. <laughs> wow. <laughs> all right, next question, please. Next question comes from Larry Stern. Larry wants to know, you mentioned you work in the environmental field. Would you mind elaborating? Yes, I work with the, it's the County of San Diego Air Pollution Control District. Doing, I mostly deal with asbestos regulations. Oh, okay. In air pollution regulations, so enforce air air pollution related laws. Right. Please don't touch anything in our club. Don't disturb any materials. I have a feeling there's probably a lot of asbestos in here based on we, the age of no, the building. absolutely not. <laughs> Nothing has been disturbed in years. We're leaving it exactly as it is in place. All right, next question. Next question is, you mentioned your friend wanted a, a cultural diffusion with visitors. Does the social structure change based on how many foreigners visit a certain family? Yes, and that's why, that's why his plan was to mix it up. Because if you... If you impact one family too much with foreigners, you, ultimately you're going to change their lifestyle. It's going to impact them, and they're going to become more commercialized, and it's going to it's it's going to change their their way of life. So his plan, and I think he's pretty successful with it, is to mix it up with different families. Hmm. And to, to go to different areas and to... I would say the, 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 the alternate, and this is the same thing, you know, in camping and leave no trace and everything is, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can either impact one place hard or you can spread out that impact. But then if you spread out the impact, you are impacting everything. So yeah. how do you make that distinction? Like, you know, when we always go out, like if you're hiking on a trail, they say, where, where do you right. camp? You camp at the campsite because that's the place that's already set up for camping true it already has the impact it's a good point but keep in mind very few visitors go to this region even at the best of times i can't imagine that many if yeah hardly any go up especially in the winter time but i would imagine probably no more than like right now 
20 people, foreigners, go up there. I, when I was, I've traveled around Russia a lot, Kamchatka, the Far East, tracking tigers and Moscow, and oh, and South Ossetia, and North Ossetia. And, and I, I always, often, people always ask me, where have you been in Russia? And I tell them where I've been. And when I mention the Amal, they're like, whoa, their jaw drops. And they're like, you've been up there? That's really remote. That's really crazy up there, and they're just fascinated that I've been up there because nobody goes up there. Yeah. So very few foreigners go up there too. And I think that's I think that's the right answer, right? From from what I've seen, if if it's such a light, low amount of people, you want to spread out the impact. But if yeah. it starts to get heavily trafficked, you want to concentrate it in one spot to minimize. It's not at risk for that happening yet. Yeah. Maybe sometime in the future. It's yeah. possible, but the conditions are just so extreme up there. Nobody wants to go there. Well, I want to go there. <laughs> it sounds awesome. In this club, I imagine a lot of yeah. people might want. Everybody to go in there, here but... wants to go there. That's for sure. All right, let's let's do one more question. Final question tonight comes from Bern, Bernie Harris again. And before uh, we ask that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and being in the chat. It's Always lovely seeing your smiling faces, and I hope you tune in next week. It's going to be another great Put show. Put emojis in there. Final question from Bernie Harris is, I assume you've been to the Antarctic. How would you compare it to the Arctic? Yes, I have been to the Antarctic. I went there on one of those uh, expedition trips from Ushuaia. It's, well, Antarctica, geograph. Well, this, I went to the peninsula, too which is very different from where I went in the Yamal. The peninsula is very mountainous, very beautiful, lots of features, lots of wildlife. The Yamal is flat and featureless. I went to the Antarctic Peninsula in the, their summertime, which, which was still, I don't know, 20, 10, 10 degrees or so, sometimes colder with the wind chill, but far warmer than the Yamal, being that I was there in the wintertime. And of course, it's... I mean, it's apples and oranges trying to compare the two. And of course, there's nobody that actually lived down, except for the, at the research stations, no tribes, no cultures that are living down mm -hmm. there. Nobody that is adapted to living in that extreme environment, except for the scientists and the researchers that are at the stations down there. But it's a very different place. And I don't know what it's like in the wintertime, and I, and I would love to go back to Antarctica and see more of it. But... It's completely different. It's Antarctic, the Antarctic Peninsula is far more beautiful, in my opinion. It's one of the most beautiful places I've been on the planet. No I people, though, right? No people, except for the uh, researchers that are down there yeah. at the stations. Lots of wildlife, amazing. The Yamal, I didn't see any wildlife. Except the reindeer. Except for the reindeer, which are domesticated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, Matt, thank you for coming by. We really appreciate it. Uh, this was fascinating, fascinating talk. Thank you for coming Thank out. You. you made the drive from San Diego, right? That's, that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so next week, we've got Gloria McCoy coming up, another, another Traveler Century Club person. Yes. Um, so Gloria is going to come up and talk about some of her travels around the world. She's another person that, that is super heavily traveled. So we're excited to have Glo her. Gloria is awesome. Gloria, I say hi. Yep. And... All right. Well... Yep. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to uh, subscribe to our channel. That helps us out. Share these videos with your friends. Remember, the Adventurers Club is about sharing stories of adventure just like this. So uh, we will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in.